from criminal justice reform to energy and infrastructure. Those are some of the issues that Stephen Hilton hopes to tackle if he's elected to become the next state representative for House District 112, which covers Sullivan's Island, the Alba Palms, and North Mount Pleasant. I speak exclusively with the Democratic candidate for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Stephen Hilton, welcome to Quentin's Close-Ups. Thank you, Quentin. It's great to be here today. You're very welcome. I, I want to rewind time because obviously you emailed me a couple of uh, months ago and basically said, hey, I'm running for the South Carolina House of Representatives for District 112. And from my understanding, you are now studying at the University of South Carolina where you'll be graduating next year. But you're also an entrepreneur because you've started an aerospace engineering star startup company called Gripen Space LLC, which focuses on designing the next generation of rocket sciences and deep space communication for so many things. Let me ask you this, Stephen. Who else is Stephen Hilton these days? Stephen Hilton is a honestly very busy man. I am with Griffin Space currently going through funding rounds and all that, so getting that entrepreneur experience. And I'm a student, like you said, so that's something I'm hoping to be more engineering focused, get my fact-based logic decisions that I can hopefully bring into running for office because that's what I want to see for South Carolina is logic and science-based decision-making. So I'm doing that up at the University of South Carolina. I'm also on the Civic Leadership Council. So keeping busy with that. I'm president of the debate team. So helping prepare the future debaters as well as keep myself prepped up and ready for those debates come next year for running for office. And like I said, graduating next year about right in line when the election is. So I'll get a, I will get elected and then run straight into office after graduation. And a personal note, I love the University of South Carolina. Every time I get up to the campus, I go straight to the School of Journalism and Communication. So that's a great place to be. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I love school indeed. And let me talk more about you because, well, let me jump right into it. You talk about debates. What is the debate right now about the future of House District 112? House District 112 is, as you know, a beautiful district. I currently have my background being the beautiful lighthouse there. I've been there many times with um, the astrophysics community actually so we're trying to make sure to protect the night skies which is for me a major issue because it's such a beautiful pristine area we want to be able to keep the astronomy focus and bring people in from cfc who their astronomy program is so strong and they love coming out to the islands so keeping that strong keep creating our shuttle program was amazing so keep expanding that to the islands that's in district 112 so we can keep people moving out there because as you know we've had a lot of the issues with the parking issues so helping to alleviate a little bit of that, thanks to Mount Pleasant working with IOP and hopefully Sullivan Island soon, get more people out there and join our beaches. And post-COVID, bringing back that tourism industry like crazy, employing as many people as we can, bringing our businesses back stronger and helping to bolster them so that they don't have to go through this again. So those are our major 112 debates going on right now of how to properly do that all. And I know uh, when you talk about parking, the, you, you know, it's been back and forth between the city of Alba Palms and obviously the Department of Air Transportation, which is right down the street from USC. <laughs> but I know that SCL, SCDOT proposed increasing parking on the island and Secretary Hall actually backed away from canceling that 2015 plan that was in place for parking on the island. Let me ask you, Stephen, do you foresee the, her pursuing more parking on the side streets and modifying that plan from 2015? I do see that because I personally live in Mount Pleasant and a lot of my neighbors when they were announcing those plans were up in arms because a lot of the reason I moved to Mount Pleasant was so that they could have that beach access. So I see that being pushed a lot harder from the Mount Pleasant side and I see them providing more parking just because, again, with COVID, they want more people coming back stronger. And to do that, they need that parking there. So we need to all work together to figure out how we can best protect the homeowners so their grass isn't being driven over all the time because I know that's a major issue that the island homeowners are having, but also allowing Mount Pleasant and downtown goers to get on the islands, bring the tourism back stronger. So I believe that that issue will be solved with more parking and more transportation from other areas to get there. Do you actually co-sign on the governor's bill that he just signed as far as beach communities? I am not 100% familiar with that bill you're talking about, so I would have to get back to you. I've been yeah. looking at a lot of other bills, so I would have to read it more uh, in depth and get back to you on that. No worries. And speaking of the depth, you said this in your website, quote, my family moved to Charleston when I was in fifth grade. I've grown up smelling the fluff mud of our marshes. I've grown up being educated in our public school system, 
and I've grown up seeing the changes and struggles that we have faced as a community. I see these challenges growing with no meaningful solutions being proposed from our state government, and I cannot just sit idly by. So let me ask you this, Stephen. How do you define the quality of life in House District 112? I would say the quality of life is very great with our beaches, but the issue comes in that it's a playground for those who have more wealth, for who, those who are born into it, and it's not really accepting of other people. Like with Highway 41, we have that major issue in Mount Pleasant of they want to go right through the Phillips community, but that's a large issue, and that would disperse others from that quality of life that we so cherish down here in the low country that I want to help not only make it a place for those who have wealth or older, I want to make it a place for those who are coming up, give them opportunity and for young people to actually enjoy all of it, which would not only increase the economy by letting more people be there, but would also increase the quality of life just by the sheer diversity of allowing more people to enjoy it. And so just a privileged few who come and stay and keep all those others out. How do you increase the quality of life for the great folks in the Phillips community? We need to sit down with the Highway 41 proposal. We need to look into how we can divert it. Because right now there's a lot of construction going on in Park West alone. So right. seeing if we could expand that a little bit, making sure that we're building new houses, not in areas that are going to be the places where future roads are going to go. So we need to future proof our community a little bit more, knowing that it's going to grow because we are the low country. Everyone wants to be here. That quality of life is so fantastic that we need to look ahead of where are we going to build roads so that we don't build houses and other infrastructure that will literally need to be teared down. That way we can protect the Phillips community right now by diverting Highway 41 possibly and any future communities making sure they don't get run over in the future with expansion. I was just in Park West Saturday and just on Monday, but let me ask you this. How future proof is the Phillips community? I would say not very much. It doesn't seem when I'm out there that much is going in the way of helping to make sure that they have that land protected because a lot of the issues are that people don't have the deeds to their houses because they've been passed down generations and they're not from wealthy families so they can't get those deeds so the city's just like, well, we're going to take the land anyways and they don't get any money for it. They don't get anything. So I don't really see much in the way of helping them maintain their housing and all of that. So I see that as an issue we need to address of making sure they have all of their deeds, make sure that if eminent domain is used, that it's used properly and it protects those members and new houses aren't being developed in the way of that construction as well. And what's your view of eminent domain right now in the Phillips community? Right now, I don't see a hundred percent. I see a need for eminent domain in the area because that area is getting highly congested and it will be become more dangerous over time if we don't do something. But right now, at the current time, I see eminent domain not as a necessity, but rather we still need to go through talks until that time comes when it's 100% a necessity to take over and build that road. And how should that road be wide? Right now, I am looking, because right now they're looking at either on 41 or through the Park West area. Right. And in the Park West area, there is a little more space to actually build that road. But instead of just looking at both one or the other, why not get together and look at possibly doing both of doing an extra lane on each for different ways and routes of traffic so that if you're going up 41, you go one direction, if you're going down 41, another one, which would help prevent even more crashes and would help protect the people who live in both areas. And let me ask you this, Stephen, too. What systematic organizational change would you make when it comes to the quality of life in that area? Can you please expand on that question? I just yeah. don't know what 100% yeah. what I mean. Yeah, this, the organizational change. How would you make that help the quality of life become better there? I would say just to boost the quality of life of any area, give them more of a voice, have them come into the council. And right now in our city council, you know, a lot of people don't come in to testify. A lot of people don't know about that. So actually encouraging people from those areas to come out. Because I know right now it's a lot of people from the outside area want to help them, but we got to make sure the people from the actual area get out there talking and that they are encouraged to talk from anyone should be more encouraged to go talk to their city council, to their state legislators more than we currently are just so that the conversation is stronger and that they can't just do something without there being actual opposition strongly 
from the residents. How strong is that, you know, opposition? Or, and, and let me ask you this more importantly. Where is the voice for these people in the Phillips community? Right now, when I see it being talked about, I don't personally see it coming directly from my area. I see it coming from people downtown or in Park West or sometimes on the islands who are piping up more and like all the signs down saying no to that uh, 41 expansion right. aren't coming from those living in the commu community. It's people coming from outside, putting those signs up and trying to talk about it. Kind of the same thing with the messenger tree. It wasn't someone who lives there or someone coming from outside. So we need to help. We need to encourage those who live in the actual areas to be their own voices instead of showering them down from outside voices, telling them what they want, what to do. And this might be a redundant question, but how can you ensure obviously smart, or obviously growth with smart growth in House District 112, particularly in that area? To ensure it, you need to not only sit down with the people who live in that area, but also urban planners, city designers to see, and the mayor of the city to see what are we seeing in the next 10 years, the expansion rate. If we look at the census data from 2010 to 2020, how do we see the shifts in population? Do we see this continuing? And if we do talk to the city planners, what do you think would be a better way of designing this so that it can be better for future people living there and for the people currently living there? And just talk with all the parties instead of letting just the state legislators decide or just one town councilman, but have all the parties actually come together in a room with people who live there and professionals to actually plan it out better who have experience doing something like that. And what are the last figures as far as population for House District 112? The latest figures, still waiting on the reviewing the data, but the population, I think, went up a couple thousand people, especially in the Mount Pleasant area. And in September, when the lines get redrawn, it'll right. be probably a little more even and fair with everyone else, hopefully. But it's... A couple of tens of thousands of people live in that area, I believe, or around it enough to interact with the economy of it. What is your fear with redistricting? My fear with redistricting is that South Carolina has a Republican supermajority in the state legislature, and I can easily see, as historically it always happens, when one party is in control that they redistrict to where they are and more power. So I personally see it becoming harder for me to run in my district or whichever district I end up in just because they want to strengthen their own party, which is why I support nonpartisan redistricting. But right now, with how it currently is, I can see it becoming a lot harder for myself and my colleagues to actually run the cycle, which is another reason why we are running is to say no matter what happens, we are going to win with whatever cards are dealt to us. So that's something I'm worried about for this year, but I believe I can overcome that. As a matter of fact, Governor McMaster has joined 15 GOP governors in a signed letter to President, President Biden's Commerce Secretary urging the release of the 2020 Census redistricting days at ASAP. Why now? Why, why does he want the data uh, released right now in your mind? I don't know. I, it might just be they want to get it done with. Because the uh, in South Carolina, our legislators, they only work half the year and they're gone the other half. So they might want to get it just done quicker and over with. Or it might be because they want more time to figure out how to make it better for them. I don't know the answer. I can only speculate. So I don't think that's fair to fully speculate on that. But those would be the two ones that I could see being a possibility. And just to be uh, fair with the viewers, uh, the state newspaper reported the data, as you mentioned, isn't slated to come out until mid-August. And the South Carolina legislator will tackle redistricting after. How did Josh they tackle that? I think personally that redistricting should be tackled through nonpartisan using computer data to aggregate where people live, the communities, make sure they're together instead of going down the line and splitting different communities by their ethnic group or by their belief systems. They should just barely put in populations with where they live, where the economy is are a whole economy and put them together in their legislative maps instead of gerrymandering, to be frank. But that's what I think. I don't think it's going to happen, but that is what I would want to see as a nonpartisan group come together and rewrite those things in a fair way.
Is this redistricting in your mind or is this gerrymandering? People are going to hate me for saying it, but I think it's going to be gerrymandering, plain and simple. That's what I see happening. And I know many people in District 112 want a clean, ethical, and accountable government. How transparent, ethical, and accountable will you be, Stephen? Yes, I, I plan to be. I, the youngest candidate running, I don't have experience lying to people. I have experience being clear, ethical. Every, I plan on every week putting out there what I'm doing, what I'm working on. And once I get elected, I plan on having a daily, this is what happened, this is what I voted on, this is what I talked about and argued for. I plan on filming everything that's happening, letting everyone see it and judge it for how it is on its face with no spin, just how it is. That's how I plan to run my campaign. That's how I hope everyone plans to run their campaign. And when they're elected, how they plan to run as an official. And, you know, you, you talk about obviously judging. Let me just talk to you about the obvious that's been, you know, mixed reviews on both sides. And that is the constitutional open carry bill, which obviously the South Carolina House of Representatives have dealt with over the past couple of weeks. But let me ask you this, Stephen. Would a constitutional carry been better? Then... The open carry. Open oh, okay. carry. I do not think so. They brought in a ton of police officers to testify, and they all said open carry was a bad idea. And then they went ahead, passed open carry anyways, slashing the fee, so losing $5 million out of our state budget, which could have gone towards researching how to stop gun deaths, closing the Charleston loophole, that we just had an anniversary of a tragedy happen because of that. But it seems they didn't care because they just want to push forward something that's not logic based, not fact based, but rather just because it's a core belief. And I don't think that was right. Everyone who came in to testify said not to do it. They did it anyways. And I think it needs to be undone personally because I just see more tragedies happening time and time again now because you see someone with a gun, you shoot, a police officer comes in, they see you with a gun, they don't know you're the good guy. You don't have the training necessary for it. So I don't think it was a smart decision. Well, let me I have a way. And let me ask you this, Stephen. Uh, in regards to that, how, let me ask you this. How would an open carry with a training bill over the constitutional carry bill been a good compromise? It would have been a better compromise with the, with the training just because it would enforce that people have to go in. I personally support, along with background checks, uh, psych checks, just to make sure when you're getting a gun, maybe if you haven't done anything before, you might be prone to do it. So I think we should also check for that. And then the training would be better because in that training, you can have that you train how to notify officers that you aren't the bad guy with the gun. You're the good guy and that you know how to actually use it, not harm yourself or accidentally harm a child in the house. I think that training would go a long way to help those who don't support open carry feel more comfortable with having people open carry is knowing that they had proper training. What type of mental health funding should the state put aside for this type of, uh, you know, uh, issue? Well, I think the $5 million state is slashed with waiving the fees would go a long ways towards that mental health screening for guns. But I don't think really you can put a price tag on ensuring people's lives and safety by putting it, putting a price tag on that mental health screening and mental health help. I think whatever the price tag is, I'm willing to accept it to help as many of our citizens as we can. And how should the state go about regulating concealed weapon permits right now? Right now, I think we, along with training and background checks, we need to ensure that we don't have just after a few days, if your background check doesn't come back and you can get a gun. We need to have that background check not only at stores, but gun shows and anywhere else you may get a gun. Mental health screens consider Possibly having a every 10 to 20 years, you have to re go get checked to make sure you can still do it. Because like with driving, you're driving, but when you get older, you might not be able to drive as well. It could be the same with a gun. You might forget your training, so you need to go back to get training. I think that would go a long ways to also ensuring people feel more safe. They know people are keeping up with that training and making sure that they are continuously able to keep holding that firearm. And let me turn back to your uh, district, Stephen. People talk about protecting the character of their community. If elected, how would you create a formula business act to protect District 112? So I would, to protect District 112 in the case of another, just so I can understand your question better, in case of like another pandemic or just to help make sure businesses are better. So I would make sure 
it kind of doesn't make sense on the face, but with rising climate change causing more hurricanes to happen every day, that's threatening our islands and their business a lot. So I think you need to implement some climate action into protecting those businesses, especially here in the low country, because that's a major issue that holds them back every year. They have to shut up their businesses or their businesses might get completely flooded and destroyed. So that needs to be in there. But we also need to set aside some relief so that if something happens, we need to make sure that while there's still going to be risk in starting business and running a business, that if luck turns against you, if there's a hurricane, if there's a pandemic, that you're not going to lose everything and we'll be able to stay open. So we need to put in that relief to make sure that if something goes really wrong and you're a bad businessman, maybe you shouldn't be doing business. But if there's a pandemic that you can't control or a hurricane you can't control, that you'll be protected and by the state and won't have to fire all your employees and lose your livelihood. And then a lot of people talk about regulatory environment. How would you allow people to incorporate clean energy sources like solar into their businesses and homes? We need to not only continue, but also expand our credits for having that solar in there, where instead of paying it all up front, you can pay it over a 20-year period broken up, maybe with the energy savings you get, you can pay it back to pay off for solar panels. But we need to be pumping those solar panels out to everyone, not only for our environment, but it also just makes over time the business cheaper to run. It makes your space that you own more appealing to leasers. It's just an overall better thing. So we need to expand those uh, incentives to get those solar panels and make them cheaper and drive competition to get that price down so that everyone who wants one can get one. That would help businesses save money. It would help the environment. So over time, they can say that they're helping the environment, which gets more people to come in because people like to purchase green products that are sustainably made and produced and operated. So that would help them bring in more tourists as well as over time, protect their business and save money. Have you been able to talk to the business owners on Palm Boulevard and Alva Palms or on Middle Street and Sullivan's Island? On Sullivan's Island? I unfortunately have not. Every time I unfortunately try to reach someone, I am facing the barrier of being one of the youngest candidates to ever run. People don't really want to take me seriously right now until things start getting a little more traction. Especially like this interview will help me get a little more traction, not gonna lie. But people are having a hard time believing that I'm running and that I want to help them and per- help our community and lift everyone up so i'm still working through that but i'm trying to talk to everyone i can who will listen to me and talk to me and tell me their issues and and, and when you talk to those people the ones who allow you to talk to them what exactly Mm -hmm. are those issues that they're complaining to you about they are scared about next wave pandemics the shutdowns they're scared about tourists they're not really scared about tourists coming back but rather them coming back and then leaving again so they just want to be maintained and know that no matter what happens, they're going to be safe and be able to keep running their business and not have to lay off employees because they like their employees and they don't want to see them suffer. So they want to make sure that they don't have to get rid of them. So that's what they're mostly scared of is another pandemic, another lockdowns, all of the chaos that they can't control. And lastly, let me ask you, uh, how would you as a state representative create more jobs in 112 and collaborate with those businesses to change how people actually commute to work? Well, I'll start with your commuting to work question. I am a big advocate for expanding our public infrastructure and our public transportation systems in a clean, sustainable way. So adding more of those CARTA green electric only buses into our systems, possibly some light uh, rail over our bridges, because we just added those bike lanes very prominently to the islands so adding maybe a tram or a light rail through that can connect mount pleasant downtown and the islands together to keep that economy running and i personally believe that if we do that then economic activity in one area will spread to those other areas because when someone earns a dollar say at iop but lives in mount pleasant and it's easier for them to commute then that dollar will make its way to mount pleasant where it can be then spent and used and that cycle can continue so i believe that's what's best for stirring the economic activity is connecting people together more will help them bring one dollar from one area to another area that can then circulate through the economy and build up more communities instead of just the one that was originally spent in. Stephen Hilton, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Full Subs and I hope to have you back on later this year.